If I told you extinct animals like the woolly mammoth could come back to life, you'd call me crazy, right? I've done expeditions all around the world where I search and in some cases find extinct animals. In fact, I've found eight previously thought extinct animals over the years, but most extinct animals cannot be found. They're no longer roaming the planet. However, thanks to colossal biosciences and their amazing scientific breakthroughs that rival something out of Jurassic Park, there's a chance in our lifetime, we might get to see some of these long lost species brought back to life. In this video, I'll break down which seven animals I think could return, starting with my personal favorite, the Tasmanian tiger. The Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine, is hands down my favorite extinct creature in the world. And honestly, it should be yours too. It is a massively cool, marsupial carnivore. Imagine a hybrid between a wolf and a coyote and a tiger and a kangaroo all wrapped into one absolutely insane animal that used to inhabit all the way from Papua New Guinea down to Tasmania around 4,000 years ago. Well, when dingoes came in, they outcompeted the thylacine and expatriated them from mainland Australia, likely Papua New Guinea, but dingoes never made it to Tasmania. And so in Tasmania, the thylacine persisted much longer than it did anywhere else. So back in Tasmania, we know that the thylacine was living and thriving because there were no dingoes to outcompete it. The last one was there until 1936, an animal named Benjamin in the Hobart Zoo. There's actual footage of that creature. It's unbelievable. However, in the wild, outside of captivity, the last known thylacine was killed in 1930 by a man named Wilfred Batty. And the reason that the thylacine were killed there, which is so sad, such a tale of human ignorance, was that we human beings actually put a bounty on the thylacine head because we believed that they were gonna kill out all the sheep and all of the, uh, all of the animals that were being farmed in Tasmania, when the actuality is it's very similar to a coyote in which the thylacine may have occasionally taken a sheep, but it certainly wasn't going to destroy all of the farmer's livestock. So a really, really sad story for these animals that were driven to extinction in the 1930s. However, to this day, tales persist that the thylacine is still out there. There are many people that are rampant believers that the thylacine is still extant, myself included, not in Tasmania, not in Australia, but up in the wilds of Western Papua and Papua New Guinea. That being said, I may never find one because that's a very remote region and they could be functionally extinct. However, Colossal is doing something that is frankly, well, Colossal. They are working to bring back a thylacine and they're doing that by taking DNA from the thylacine because we have samples in museums around the world and editing the genes with the fat-tailed Dunnart, the thylacine's closest living relative, that's only about one one hundredth the size of a thylacine. However, with artificial wombs and this incredible DNA sequencing, Colossal is going to bring back a thylacine. Now, why is that important? Because, while it may not seem like it, Tasmania is broken. The ecosystem there is not the way that it should be without its apex predator, the thylacine. So what you see is major ecological issues in Tasmania, like rampant facial tumor disease in the Tasmanian devils, all kinds of mange in some of the smaller animals like wombats and wallabies. And this is because there is no biocontrol. There is no apex predator to clean up that ecosystem. Now, this is of course a very simplified way of looking at it. If and when Colossal is successful, which they will be, they're gonna be working with Aussie Ark to bring thylacine back to Tasmania where they belong, reintroducing them into the wild and repairing the ecosystem. And it's hard for me to even fathom that in my lifetime, one way or another, whether I find it or Colossal beats me to it, I am gonna get to see a thylacine. On a scale of one to 10, I'm gonna give this a nine out of 10 likelihood of being brought back in our lifetime. Next up is something I'm really excited about, a big, fluffy Arctic elephant. The woolly mammoth was a species of prehistoric elephant that lived during the Pleistocene epoch, roughly about 700,000 to about 4,000 years ago. So it was here pretty recently, especially on the California Channel Islands here in Santa Barbara where I live. In fact, on these islands, you had insular dwarfism where little tiny mammoths would hang out because they were trapped on an island with less resources. That's a whole nother story for another day, but it is an incredible thing to think about. Now, why might you ask, are the woolly mammoths so important? Well, believe it or not, woolly mammoths help keep the planet colder. And in an ever heating globe, 
To be able to help keep the planet colder means the slowing down of change and change of the ecosystem and helping the entire planet. Woolly mammoths were similar in size to modern elephants. They get anywhere from about 9 to 11 feet at the shoulder. Their tusks, which were long, curved, and spiraled, could reach lengths of up to 16 feet, which compared to modern elephants is absolutely insane. They were big, hairy, and had massive foot pads in order for them to be able to survive in such cold environments. Believe it or not, woolly mammoths were widespread and inhabited a range that extended from Northern Asia across Europe and into North America. They adapted to various environments, including grasslands and tundra and islands, like I mentioned, which make them so unique. Like modern elephants, woolly mammoths were social animals that lived in family groups. They were herbivores, primarily feeding on grasses and other vegetation. We discovered woolly mammoth remains in the permafrost, and what's so interesting about that, and why woolly mammoths are so interesting, is that woolly mammoths can actually help save the planet. I know that sounds insane, but if you think about it, woolly mammoths used to live in an area way up north in a cold, frozen tundra that was similar to the plains of Africa. Now why is that? Why were... Why was the Arctic like a giant savanna? Well, because woolly mammoths would knock down the trees and pack in the snow by stomping on the snow. Once woolly mammoths were expatriated, big trees were able to grow and the woolly mammoths wouldn't knock them down and that created a giant insulating layer of snow that wasn't getting crushed. So all of this is to say that without woolly mammoths, the environment changed, the Arctic has become warmer and the permafrost is melting at a much faster rate. Well, under that permafrost is a bunch of dead vegetation, and dead, rotting vegetation puts off a ton of carbon. So, as the permafrost recedes, carbon is put into the atmosphere, thus heating up the planet. By putting mammoths back in that ecosystem, mammoths can crush the ice, they can knock over trees, they can change the Arctic from what we think of today as woodlands and you know beautiful tree-covered forests to that savanna that it used to be, which in turn will keep the planet up to six degrees colder, which is a huge difference in a planet that's changing its temperature annually. So it's an amazing thing that's going on. So what's so incredible is that Colossal Biosciences is working to bring the woolly mammoth back in the next 10 years. And of course, as I just mentioned, that can ultimately help contribute to saving the planet, which I know is insane, but it actually all makes sense when you look into it. So. You're asking yourself, how could this be done? Well, we have Indian elephants, which are 99.6, I believe, percent related to woolly mammoths. We have a ton of woolly mammoth DNA. You bring those together, bingo, bango, boom, you make some woolly mammoths that are gonna be back in the environment in our lifetime on a scale of one to 10, I'd say a 10 out of 10, 100% chance that we're gonna get to see woolly mammoths. Up next, an animal that the whole world knows as being one of the biggest dum-dums in history. The dodo is such an incredible giant bird that the whole world knows about even though no one alive today has ever seen one, which is an insane thing to think about. And the reason being, they went extinct in the 17th century. Now, they went extinct by such a terrible methodology, it's hard to even explain. But if you think about this, you're an old British sailor who lands on an African island called Mauritius, and walking around are these big old three-foot birds that have absolutely no fear of human beings, hence how they got the reputation of being dumb, and you're bored and got nothing to do, so you take a big old wampum stick and bash them on the head. And this, as crazy as it sounds, is what drove the incredible bird, the dodo, one of the largest doves or pigeons that ever existed, to extinction. Now, this is awful because it's an iconic, amazing creature that has been wiped off the face of the earth. However, it may not be for long. Colossal Biosciences, yeah, you're gonna hear a lot about them today because they're doing some insane work, is working to bring the dodo back in our lifetime. Now, how are they doing that? They're doing it through a process called PGCs, or primordial germ cells. Now, PGCs in birds are very complicated. I'm not even gonna pretend that I fully understand it, but what they are gonna do is take the PGCs, the primordial germ cells, of the Nicobar pigeon, the closest living relative of the dodo, and work to genetically modify those to be very, very close to the dodo, and then bring in all the dodo samples, mix that cocktail together, put it inside a chicken, Chicken lays a really big egg that hatches into a dodo. Just like that, dodo is brought back from extinction and Colossal is working with the Mauritian government to be able to reintroduce dodo into the wild 
in the next few years. On a scale of one to 10, I would give this about an eight out of 10 for coming back in our lifetime. Next up, a big, interesting European goat. The Pyrenees Ibex is a fascinating giant goat. It's an Ibex that lives in the mountain range between Spain and France, known as the Pyrenees Mountains, and it's actually an animal that I had planned on targeting in season three of Extinct or Alive. And the reason being, a handful of both naturalists and hunters have been into the Pyrenees Mountains and claimed that they have seen a small, singular group of Pyrenees Ibex hopping from ledge to ledge up in these mountains. Now, the reason this is plausible, even in a place as populated as Europe, is because, like most ibex, these animals are unbelievably agile and capable in mountain ranges. So they can hop up and down the sides of shale and cliff that a human being could never do without crazy climbing gear and harnesses and ropes. And so for a smart, agile goat to be able to hide in a small group beyond human detection for a long period, may seem ridiculous, but it is possible. Now, while the other animals I've spoken about to date all went extinct a long time ago, what's really sad is the Pyrenees Ibex actually had conservation efforts taking place in the latter part of the 20th century because there were so few left that people wanted to try and conserve them. But sadly, even with conservation efforts in place, the group of animals that was still known to exist declined and there were fewer and fewer until the eventual extinction happened in 2000 when the last known Pyrenees Ibex, a female named Celia, died. Which is crazy because that's only 23 years ago that we lost the species. So why might you ask, did this animal go extinct? There's plenty of other Ibex living in plenty of other places. Well, historically, the Pyrenees Ibex was subject to intense hunting pressure, both for its meat but also, sadly, as a trophy animal because they have such incredible horns and such a distinct signature look that people really wanted them both to eat, but more so as a trophy. And this is one of those cases where human greed directly led to the extinction of a beautiful animal that should still be there. But it wasn't all hunting pressure's fault. There were introduced diseases that were likely transmitted from domestic livestock that also played a role in the decline of the Pyrenees Ibex. And that's what we saw when these conservation efforts kicked in and we tried to save them, we tried to stop hunting, but there had this respiratory infections and parasites that just devastated uh, the remaining population. So sadly, it was too little too late and the animal was driven to extinction. So when the last known Pyrenees Ibex cilia died in 2000, there was a cloning attempt in 2003 using preserved tissue from cilia, which resulted in the birth of a cloned Ibex, also named cilia. But what was so sad is this was the early days of that sort of genetic work, and the new cilia was born with lung abnormalities, which led to its death pretty shortly after its birth. So the cloning experiment was not considered a success, and they shut down all operations to continue that. But hopefully now, some 20 years later, we've got to a point where the technology is capable of making a viable clone. And so while the Pyrenees Ibex still remains extinct and the last cloning attempt was a failure, the science is rapidly advancing in these fields and with some of the work that's being done and some of our understanding of closely related species like goats and sheep, I believe that there's a good chance that in our lifetime we could see the return of the Pyrenees Ibex. However, it doesn't seem to be a high priority for most, so I'm gonna give this one about a six out of 10. Next up, an animal that had a population density so great that it used to black out the sun. The passenger pigeon was an incredible species of pigeon that was once the most abundant bird species in North America. Characterized by its striking appearance, it had blue-gray plumage with pinkish-orange underparts and iridescent feathers on the neck. I mean, this was a beautiful bird that numbered in the millions and would flock together in giant groups to black out the sun. What's so crazy is that an animal like this that had so many millions and millions could be driven to extinction in such a short amount of time by people. And I actually got to hold a passenger pigeon, albeit it was a taxidermied one, at a museum in Denmark. These were the most abundant birds in North America. And while a lot of reports say millions, there's a lot of science to suggest that there were actually billions of these migratory birds. True to its name, the passenger pigeon was highly migratory, hence the passenger name. It undertook seasonal migrations in search of food 
and nesting in these large colonies that would cover these vast distances. One of the reasons that losing the passenger pigeon was so detrimental is because passenger pigeons actually shaped the ecology and the habitats of our forests. Now, the reason they did that is because their diet consisted mostly of fruits and nuts, things that have seeds. So they'd come in, they'd land in these giant flocks, they'd eat all these fruits, nuts, and seeds, and then they'd fly off somewhere pooping out seeds that were ready to germinate and create forests. So those ecosystems have been devastated with the loss of these billions of incredible animals. Passenger pigeons were prolific breeders. They nested in enormous colonies, and a single tree could host thousands of nests. The birds would lay one or two eggs, and the chicks were cared for by both parents. What's crazy is despite their once immense population, the passenger pigeons suffered a rapid and dramatic decline in the late 19th century due to extensive hunting habitat destruction, and disruption of their migratory patterns. The last confirmed individual, a female named Martha, died in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, marking the extinction of a once great species. So how did it go extinct? Well, believe it or not, it was from hunting pressure. There were so many of them that you could reach up in the sky and just blast, and tens and tens of passenger pigeons would fall to the ground. Now the problem is the dynamic of the passenger pigeon is it's such a social animal that when it doesn't have a whole bunch of other ones around it, they don't know how to behave, they don't know how to act properly. And uh, when you couple that with the rapid reduction in genetic diversity, which happened from the human pressure, the changing of the habitat, the hunting, the staggering of the flock, so on and so forth, basically the entire population collapsed because they didn't know how to adapt to everything that was changing and all of the pressures that were being applied to them at the same time. And what's really sad is their survival mechanism, the safety and numbers of their giant flocks, is what led to the overexploitation and their crash because as there were fewer and fewer, they'd group up more and more because they were social animals and then a hunter would just find a group and blast every single one. So the fewer there were, the more they cluster, the easier they were to target. So such a tragic loss of such an incredible creature. So are they coming back? Well, there was one initiative called the Revive and Restore Project, which was, a, was or is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the field of de-extinction. And they wanted to do this with the passenger pigeon through selective breeding. Uh, that combined with genetic engineering. So the idea was to identify living bird species with genetic similarities to the passenger pigeon, selectively breed them to amplify the passenger pigeon-like traits, and then genetically engineer what was left in order to make them as close as possible to the passenger pigeon. Well, the reality is you haven't heard much about it, and I think that the reason being is you can't bring back one passenger pigeon. You can't bring back 10 passenger pigeons because as I said, that just leads to bigger problems for that species. So if you're going to clone and bring back passenger pigeons, you have to bring back thousands at once in order for them to successfully thrive and for them to be enough genetic diversity for them to uh, be able to reproduce on their own. So to me, as sad as it seems, it seems like on a scale of one to 10, the passenger pigeon may in fact be lost forever. I'd give this one a two out of 10. Next up, the weirdest looking zebra, or as you Americans like to say, zebra, even though you're saying it wrong, that you've ever heard of. The quagga was a subspecies of plain zebra that inhabited South Africa until it became extinct in the late 19th century. This animal is such a unique and interesting creature. It's something that I always, as a kid, wanted to see because I grew up in an area that had a lot of wild zebra, but the quagga living on the coast was its own special thing that really looked like a zorse, right? A zebra horse, some sort of hybrid that wasn't very close to anything today, but at the same time, very, very close to both a zebra and a horse. So just an amazing looking creature that I always sort of wish I'd had the ability to see, and I may actually get to see again one day in the future. So the quagga was distinct from other zebras due to its unique coat pattern, which featured stripes only on the front part of the body, with the rear half being brown and unstriped. This distinguishing appearance set the quagga apart from other zebra species, which typically, as you know, have stripes across their entire body. Now, why did it go extinct? Well, once again, 
Where to blame? Uh, extinction by overhunting is what happened. Uh, their population declined in the 19th century. European settlers targeted them for their meat and their hides, and because they had a pretty small range, uh, they were led to extinction. The last known quagga, a female, died in captivity at the Natura Artis Magistra Zoo in Amsterdam, August 12, 1883. Her name was Lady, and her death marked the extinction of the quagga. Now, because we understand that the quagga was a subspecies, selective breeding for conservation has actually led to the quagga basically coming back. So there's a group called the Quagga Project that utilizes selective breeding, meaning choosing zebras with fainter stripes on their back half and breeding them more and more and more and more so that you breed for those traits, hence selective breeding, to bring the quagga back into existence. And it's pretty cool. So while the Quagga Project focuses on visual traits, genetic studies uh, with the plain zebra show how characterizing and the genetic diversity of the original population can actually be brought back. So it's all sort of coming back together through selective breeding, which is basically how the quagga would have diverged from a plain zebra in the beginning. It would have slowly over time formed from the quagga deciding to breed more and more with animals that look like themselves to differentiate from the plain zebra. So what we are doing now, even though humans led it to extinction, is we are speeding up that evolution by selecting for those traits to bring it back. So on a scale of one to 10, well, it's kind of a 10 out of 10 because thanks to the Quagga Project, those animals, or at least something very, very close to it, are back. Next up, one of the biggest cows that you've ever heard of. Well, cow may be a bit of an exaggeration, but bison antiquus, often referred to as the ancient bison or giant bison, was a species of large prehistoric bison that roamed North America during the Pleistocene. It's an ancestor of the modern American bison, bison bison, which you probably know of still exists today, hangs out in Yellowstone, so on and so forth. These guys used to get hunted by saber-toothed cats, so that era. So bison antiquus, these ancient bison, were well adapted to the diverse Pleistocene environments of North America. They used to hang out from everywhere from grasslands to forests down into Mexico, up into Alaska. They inhabited a super broad geographical range and a pretty diverse set of ecosystems, which made them incredible. Similar to modern bison, uh, they lived in social groups and engaged in migratory behavior in a response to changing seasons and resources. And so basically imagine just a bigger blown up version of the bison that we know today that would contend with all of these larger animals such as uh, mammoths and saber toothed cats, so on and so forth. So really incredible giant bison. Bison antiquus, along with many other Pleistocene megafauna, became extinct around the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000, 11,000 years ago. The causes of their extinction are still debated, but many include a combination of climate change, human hunting, and environmental factors. And quite frankly, that's usually how extinction works, right? It's a compounding effect of a whole bunch of different pressures that lead to the extinction, not just hunting, or just invasive species, or just climate change, so on and so forth. And this is uh, a perfect example of how three various factors led to the end of a species. So will we see bison again in our lifetime? Well, here's an interesting thought. We know more about bovid, cow, bison reproduction than we do about any other species because for as long as human history has been around, we've been trying to breed cows for meat. And so we've learned so much about the reproductive science of animals like bison that we're actually more advanced in that than we are of any of these other species. However, as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any efforts to bring bison antiquus back today. So instead, what you have is a giant extinct bison that likely we could bring back very rapidly if we decided to, but nobody is trying to. Because of that, and because of companies like Colossal, I think that there's a pretty good possibility that if we put the effort in, we'll see bison antiquus again in our lifetime. I'm gonna give this one a seven out of 10. Bringing back species is a controversial topic, right? Of course it is, there's movies like Jurassic Park out there. But returning species to an environment that human beings have directly removed is a very important and substantial thing. Now I like to explain it like this. Imagine the Earth like a giant game of Jenga. Now you can pull out bison antiquus and you can pull out mammoth and you can pull out thylacine, but at some point you're gonna pull out one tile too many and the whole thing is gonna collapse. Well, 
de-extinction gives us the opportunity to put those tiles back in that Jenga tower and make it stronger than ever, strong to the point that it was when humans first started deciding to pull those pieces out. So while de-extinction may be a controversial topic and there is a lot to figure out, there's a lot of different directions it can go, using it for good, using it for conservation and restoration and rewilding is one of the greatest advancements in scientific history. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please make sure to comment below and let me know which extinct animal you wish you could see brought back to life in your lifetime.